Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you <clears throat> for the opportunity <clears throat> to speak to you. Uh, this will be a lot of fun. I'm going to have the most fun because I'm just going to uh, give you the brief overview. Um, so let's see. It must be. Yes. Okay. There we go. Uh, American Samoa has about 67,000 people right now, largely Samoan ethnicity. It is a U.S. territory. Uh, modernization and globalization, as we would now call it, uh, particularly around changes in way of life, diet, physical activity, occupational structures, educational attainment, really began to take off in the 1970s. Um, I started studying there, doing research there in the mid-70s, and um, given uh, the, the good fortune and the beneficence of the USNIH, um, hope to continue doing that and have been doing that since. Um, so say a prayer for all of us on that one. Um, the study took place in this region uh, of uh, American Samoa, of the main island of Tutuila, and we'll talk about that in a moment. Just to let you know, this is these are the two main islands of the independent country of Samoa, about 100 kilometers to the west, a lot more neo-traditional, a lot more rural out here in Savai'i, uh, just because I work in both places and uh, just wanted to give you the context. Um, Samoa was completely Christianized by missionaries in the 1700s, uh, became a U.S. territory in 1900 as part of the United States um, uh, predatory expansion and hegemony <laughs> of the Pacific, uh, looking towards the Philippines and China and our manifest destiny, which our early presidents in the 1900s articulated so nicely. Uh, it's a wonderful place to work, um, and largely my work has been about what we now call the health transition, documenting declines in infectious diseases um, over time. Uh, U.S. troops and New Zealand troops were billeted in Tutuila, on Tutuila during World War II. So no doubt some of these changes happened directly because of Ameri uh, U.S. American uh, infrastructure improvement around medicine, hospitals, public health as well. Obviously, as you know, setting the stage then for more people living into their middle years and um, the possibility for these things to occur. We started working, I started working in the mid-1970s and have continued, and I show here just a series of data from the 1970s, 1990, and 2002, uh, three basic population representative samples showing an increase in obesity. Notice the definition is 32 uh, kilograms per meter square BMI units contrasted to the WHO standard of 30, recognizing the different body composition in Samoan human bodies compared to uh, those of the WHO, European and African-derived populations. Um, if you look even in 1976, and this is um, men and men 45 to 54, and then women, women 45 to 54, you would certainly say that from both the men who are already upwards of 27% and the women uh, who were over half at that time, we missed the early health transition. Thus, when Akil introduced me, the movement towards some African societies, some of personal professional interest to capture the health uh, nutrition transition much earlier. Anyway, um, astounding levels of obesity uh, are really one of the main features of our work and no doubt why uh, we continue to be funded on that. And turning to today's topic, type 2 diabetes, clearly very high levels um, given um, uh, comparisons to other Pacific islands, which are also high, uh, even contemporary China and India in their urban areas, which are going through the nutrition transition, are nowhere near these levels, and certainly far less than uh, any of the ethnic groups in the United States, although Mexican Americans in the U.S. come close to some of these levels of prevalence, if you will. And again, showing males tend to have a higher uh, odds than women do, that age increases the odds at each of the two time points. We didn't take fasting blood in the 1970s. We should have, but we didn't. 
Um, and so what happened here really is that I began to think with American Soil and Department of Health officials that it was time for an intervention. And this was very mutual. Um, one of them even said to me, Steve, this is great. We know how bad things are because of you. And every time you come <laughs> down, you tell us how bad things are. Um, but uh, wouldn't it be interesting to try to get some of your colleagues from Brown to come down here and do some intervention-based research, which is precisely what I did. It took a while and took talking to different people, but certainly identifying Judy and having Rochelle on board uh, was really important. A couple pictures just to sort of show the non-existent, well, there's a new market downtown uh, and our real challenge uh, as vehicles, vehicle ownership, vehicle use, and fast food, takeaway food of all sorts really became quite the norm and a lot of the work I've done is around that. This project really began to take off uh, at the time of the building and planning, planning and building of the first community health center uh, in American Samoa. And this is uh, the Tafuna uh, Clinic of the American Samoa Community Health Centers. At the time, it was called the, the Tafuna Family Health Center because it was the only one. Luckily, uh, during the ARA funding years, not that long ago, they were able to expand and build uh, several other uh, of these uh, primary health care centers. We decided with them that they could use our research setting, whose study aims were here, and I'll walk through really quickly in a moment, as a way to evaluate their activities. I saw it as an opportunity to do a piece of intervention research when they were also quite ready. So I know Rochelle and perhaps Judy will talk a little bit about this. I would say this was community engaged research, not really CBPP, community-based participatory research in a sense, although we did a lot of talking both formally as part of this study that you'll hear about, but a lot of probably five or six years of talking about how to do this, what to do, and um, candidly speaking, um, waiting for the health officials to recognize the truth of the obesity and the diabetes problem there, which they had been in some mild to moderate level of, I would say, denial about. It took family members and important leaders of society to begin to suffer from these conditions and die. Um, unfortunate way that happened, but I guess that is actually how it happened in a lot of places. We pr designed this to improve diabetes control, to improve other cardiovascular disease risk factors, obviously working through changes of diet and exercise behaviors, uh, but also primarily, as Shira will tell you, and probably we think, also improving the process of care and adherence, both by providers and by the patient participants themselves. Uh, we wanted to do a randomized trial because obviously a lot of the studies that we had done that Judy had experience with at the Miriam and other are reading of the literature, um, a lot of people had wanted to do community health worker interventions, but there were very few randomized trials really testing this out and very few who documented to the extent that you'll hear a little bit about today, but will really be for uh, really will be shown in our future publications, um, the details of the actual intervention. Okay, so we did formative research, which Rochelle will speak about. We did recruitment enrollment, which I'll show you one slide and then give over to the next speaker. We had the CHW intervention arm of the trial, consisting of home visits and group meetings that you'll hear more about. We had a waitlist control group because, of course, during the conversations with uh, our colleagues there, both our own ethical sense that we weren't going to do a placebo, that wasn't correct, uh, but that they definitely wanted a waitlist control. I mean, they, they understood the need to do a trial, but they wanted this. They even, one of them even said, well, you'll, kno you'll really know how to do this intervention if you wait a year, and these people will be unlucky in that first year, but luckier after that. Um, and of course, that was acceptable to both the IRBs here and there. Um, we did some post-intervention uh, qualitative work, which Rochelle will mention. And then, of course, this, this group got the CHW intervention. And if the uh, Brown Global Health Funds are successful, both in the medical school, 
the university and elsewhere. There may be two medical students going out to American Samoa this summer to do a medical record review of both groups to see the one to three year medium term follow up of this. Uh, we did cluster randomization by village and so this was the, uh, the actual sequence of the villages. Some of the villages were on the larger side, Tafuna 2, Nu'uli 1, were neighborhoods within and just, you know, we, we did some mapping to really break down some of those villages. And with that, I will be delighted to turn myself unlike over to Rochelle. You want to tour? Okay. okay. Show me how you, oh yeah, I, I got know, it. I just used the, uh, the mouse wheel. Okay. And deprive me of the opportunity to walk around and gesture. <laughs> okay. So my role in the project was really twofold. Um, I'm a medical and cultural anthropologist, so I got to think a lot with Judy and Steve about how we were going to culturally adapt this intervention. And I also designed the qualitative pieces that we did, and I'm going to talk, talk to you a little bit uh, in under 10 minutes about both. So these were what we did for qualitative studies before the intervention. We did six patient focus groups. So those were focus groups of people who had diabetes. And we did 13 provider interviews with um, community outreach workers, nurses, um, uh, and uh, doctors about the experience of having diabetes in American Samoa and caring for people who had diabetes in American Samoa. We also, um, after the focus groups were done, we used the focus group uh, results to develop the materials, and I'll show you a little bit about how we did that, and Judy's going to show you some slides about what those materials look like. But she was in the field one day, um, one for about a week training. S uh, Steve and I were here, and we were on the phone with her, and I talking about the training of our staff to use the materials that we had developed. And, and I, we had this realization on the phone that we really needed to sit down and talk to our staff as we had sat down and talked to um, people who represented the um, targeted uh, participant population about what the experience was. And this um, second bullet of reviewing the drafts and the materials for the local staff I think is actually very important. And now, very deliberately, I would put it into any other um, similar project because we allowed the staff to be the experts they are in their culture and say, yes, we think this will work, no, we don't think this will work. And given the Samoan love of um, ritual and formality and an eating occasion, they said, okay, we know how to do focus groups. Let's have you sit down and audio record this and, and feed us and uh, we'll give you our opinions. Um, one of the outcomes of that is, um, as you'll see, um, the staff told us that they wanted the materials, which had been translated into Samoan, in both Samoan and English side by side, because there were certain population, there are certain people who, with whom they wanted to have the ability to use either or, and there are certain things that it was better to say in one or the other. So there was a really important outcome of uh, reviewing the draft materials with our local staff. We also did cultural translation of the uh, quantitative measures. This was a qualitative, quantitative mixed method uh, step where we actually did cognitive interviews on a subset of the qualitative instruments um, where we followed a WHO protocol for linguistic translation and back translation um, and then uh, took um, a, a small portion of the uh, total number of items that we translated and we did 10 cognitive interviews in which people were administered the items, um, they gave us their response, we tracked their responses and looked at the range of responses that we got, but there was also a qualitative step in which we said, does this make sense to you, what were you thinking about when you answered that question? Um, and then after the focus group during, af excuse me, after the intervention, we did um, the summative qualitative work where we did, um, again, focus groups with the um, uh, uh, patients in the, who received the intervention and actually Steve did interviews with um, the three um, clinicians who were involved in Tafuna Center to get some sense from them about what it was like to have this research plop down in the middle of their um, uh, center. And then once again, we sat down with the staff after they'd been actually using the materials and delivering the intervention for a year and said, what was this like for you? Um, I think that whenever you go into uh, designing the qualitative steps of the project, you should have very explicit goals. Um, for each of them, and we did, you don't always get what you think you're going to get, but you should have some sense of why you're doing it. So we were interested in learning attitudes about diabetes care, what it was like to have it, what it was like to care for people who had it, attitudes about the intervention components. We actually showed archival photographs that we were thinking about using. We showed um, a healthy plate image and talked about how to adapt those things to this environment. And we asked general questions about local attitudes about food and food choices. 
Um, we actually asked uh, for feedback on how the community health workers should behave when they went forth and delivered this intervention. And we got um, some neat messages about, well, don't park in front of the house. That's rude. You'll park to the center and go up to the side. So people were pretty engaged in telling us how they thought we should do this. Um, and you heard about the cognitive interviews. So this is some of what we heard in analyzing this data. We heard a lot about how maintaining a healthy diet is quite challenging. Food's expensive. Imported foods are very processed. They're uh, costly. The local food that's available is often um, not good choices, particularly um, meat sources, protein sources. Turkey tails and mutton flaps are very high fat um, uh, cuts of meat that are actually discarded elsewhere in the world and find their way to American Samoa, um, where people eat them. <coughs> we uh, learned that the individual does not often control his or her food preparation, so that when we ask people to change their food choices, it's a complex thing. It may be not something they have control over, or it may involve the changing, changing of the food consumption patterns for um, the extended family. There are in American Samoa still ritual family gatherings. That word is fa'alave lave. Um, that are a particular challenge. They, um, they happen when someone dies and there's a funeral, but also when there's a chiefly investiture or perhaps a wedding. They are these elaborate cultural productions um, that require um, the provision of food and also the giving away of food in what's called an Ienga basket, a family basket. Um, but even more than the food challenges, people are required culturally when this happens to make significant financial contributions to allow the host family, of which they are an extended part, to pull this off. Um, and there's some interesting anthropological work written about, you know, well, why don't people just say, I don't have it? And there is no saying, I don't have the money. You find the money, whether you beg or borrow it or however you get it. And finding that money becomes an impediment, perhaps, to whether you're going to eat the frozen chicken breast or the available turkey tails that week, or whether you pay for the copays for your medicine. We heard rather a lot about that. We also heard that um, for some more traditional um, local foods, um, taro and bananas, people didn't always know whether that was health helpful for people with diabetes to eat. Um, barriers to ca care included the cost of medication and the copays that I mentioned. We discovered during the course of the intervention that um, there people often seek care on off late in the medical event. Um, there was not everyone had the numeracy necessary to understand um, the fluctuations in blood sugar and what that meant. Um, there was often, um, in particularly in the qualitative data, some evidence that people didn't really understand um, the nature of taking medications for chronic diseases, that one had to take them continually um, and, re and uh, re renew the prescriptions. Um, we asked um, a little bit about stress and depression, and we found um, that these large family gatherings were actually sources of stress. Um, after we did the qualitative analysis, um, I did something that was really very fun for me, um, which is I really del delved back into the ethnographic record. And there is a significant ethnographic record about American Samoa. As a graduate student, I, of course, read Margaret Mead, but I hadn't actually read a lot more. So we spent, um, I spent quite a lot of time reading that. And this is a combination of what we learned from um, uh, keeping the intervention on the ground and running, what we learned from the qualitative uh, information, and then also what we learned from the ethnographic record. Traditionally, in this culture, feasting plays an incredibly big role. Food um, has a role in social functions. We talk about frequent food-rich cultural events. Um, it is quite difficult to eat in a manner different from the people around you. Um, at these big events in particular, food is considered a gift, and it's quite rude to turn it down, in part because your host family's ability to provide for you very large quantities reflects very highly on them, so it's insulting to not take it. But often food is, was traditionally served in these events by rank. So if you got served first because you were high status, it becomes really embarrassing or important not to say, oh, thanks, I don't want that plate and I don't want to eat it. So this is um, data from the ethnographic record from the 50s, the 70s, and the 80s, not necessarily the present, but it does reflect the environment in which, uh, out of which current food attitudes, I think, developed. Um, there's also um, a little bit of interesting data about um, physical activity. Um, it suggests that 
this is a gerontocracy. People um, obtain power um, as they get older, um, and uh, people who have high status and high power are usually older folks. Um, and it is expected, particularly of chiefs, power has with it this notion of size and stillness. That's part of what it means to look like um, a senior powerful person. So we heard in our uh, qualitative work, for instance, that you, you know, in the old days you never saw um, aunties uh, walking. People didn't go for walks. People didn't exercise. Um, part of being um, uh, that um, status of life meant you could sit still and other people walked for you. Um, the medical anthropology of the Pacific tells us very clearly that the notion of health, physical health, is constructed um, from not the kind of markers that we actually measured in the study, but rather whether you're spiritually healthy, whether you're morally in good standing, and what the nature of your social relationships are with other people. Um, so you've heard me say that um, decisions about food might not be made by the individual. Decisions about health care might not be made by the individual. The family may be, the extended family might make decisions. Um, because there's a long tradition of the family being involved in healthcare. So we took the information we got from the qualitative data, we took what we learned from the ethnographic record, and this is how we began to build some of those things into the intervention. So the Samoan way, which has um, uh, rather important roles for tradition and respect um, and sharing of resources, the way you, sh you show respect and show love, alofa and fa'a'alo'alo, alo, is actually by sharing resources. So um, in order to um, accommodate that and also the notion of the importance of family. When our community health workers went out to somebody's house, um, other family members were invited to sit down and be part of the teaching. So it wasn't limited to just the individual who was enrolled. Um, for the respect for authority, um, another um, key Samoan cultural value, we really emphasized the role of the physician advice and support. We did a lot of problem solving around these um, food and food-based uh, occasions, um, including um, teaching people what a healthy diet looked like, um, what healthy sources of um, protein were, and also um, what locally grown foods were healthy. And as you'll see, we used um, quotes from the um, focus groups about people's struggles and successes with eating and physical activity and medication taking, and they pepper um, the uh, intervention materials that the CHWs used to give things a local voice. And we can actually talk a little bit about what it means to do an intervention about that has a, as its key uh, increasing self-management in this very collectivist environment if we have time at the end. But now I get to pass the baton or the mic <coughs> on to Judy. So start by clipping yourself in. I want to pick up on um, this, the theme of community-engaged research. As Steve mentioned, um, there were several conversations with our local partners before we, we wrote the grant, to be, you know, as we were you know, thinking through what we would do. And um, along that, during that process, we identified a program announcement for translation research and with diabetes care and um, to decrease uh, health disparities and underserved populations. So that seemed to be a good place to go. So during um, one of our meetings with our partners, we presented a, a menu of um, different evidence-based uh, uh, intervention strategies that um, we found in, in the literature and let them choose among those options as to what they thought might work best there. And um, the concept of outreach work, you know, building on their sort of, you know, public health nursing history um, was, was really um, what they most appreciated. And then we found in the literature a, a study, that, um, this Project Sugar, which is based in Baltimore, that used a, a nurse community health worker team in a primary care setting that seemed to be a good model to build on and to translate for this setting. So um, th that was used with urban African-American um, population. They used a nurse and a case manager with community health workers. Um, 
it, it was theory-based, which we uh, appreciated based on the pre-seed uh, proceed model. And um, they used a number of different um, concepts that the literature had said were, were um, important in, in terms of changing health behavior. So treatment algorithms, and I'll come back to that, to guide the decisions about frequency of visits, um, home clinic and home visits, um, and the primary care coordination. Um, so the, the algorithms um, did, while we were adapting this intervention, we had to make some adjustments to it to fit the context. The um, blood sugars, blood diabetes control in American Samoa population was uh, worse than in African American population in Baltimore. So we had to have higher cut points for to in order to manage patients. Um, visits so that it, the workload would be reasonable for our staff. So we had higher cut posts and some slightly different parameters that we used. So blood pressure, um, HbA1c is diabetes control, depression, smoking, alcohol use were the parameters that we used and we developed decision rules about frequency of visits. And I'll show you on the next slide what that looked like. Um, we also um, had because we had fewer health professionals to work with in, on the healthcare team, um, we ha had to train our community health workers to do most of the diabetes education themselves during their visits. So we adapted um, some flip charts uh, that were used in uh, diabetes prevention work um, from CDC, and we adapted them for more um, general education around uh, diabetes management. And we use the um, American Association of Diabetes Educators seven health behaviors listed here, and um, that became sort of the basis of the education, that primarily through the flip charts that I'll show you. So the algorithm um, decision rules. Um, so we had three levels plus an urgent care, you know, where when people were referred for immediate attention, um, and people who were at lower risk based on these parameters were seen quarterly, people who were at moderate r risk were seen monthly by our staff, and high risk were seen uh, weekly in groups primarily, or that was the intent anyway. And if they had any of these parameters in the higher, in a higher level, that, that bumped them up to get the higher level, um, risk, le risk level for frequency of visits. And there were um, decision rules, too, about how people could graduate to a lower level of care if they did better or how they got bumped up to higher level if they, their condition worsened. Um, so the community health workers, um, this is a, our, our research office in American Samoa. Their, their role involved meeting at least four times, you know, if they were low-risk people. Um, with the patients eat, meet, eat more frequently for people who are in good control. They went um, either to their home, sometimes to the workplace, um, or at the clinic based on the patient's choice. Um, what they did during the contacts was um, assisting people in meeting and keeping their medical appointments, um, reinforcing taking medications, helping them understand diabetes, and. Um, problem solve around, around their self-care, and promoting behavior changes, diet, exercise, uh, coping for stress, um, and providing social support. Who were they? Um, over the, the time of our trial, we, um, we had a, the, there were four community health workers and, the, and one nurse on the team, um, but over the course of the study, we had eight different people filling those roles. Um, the, they were, it was designed to be high school level at minimum, and, but many of them had some healthcare training in addition, that was a plus if they did, so they had some certifications and other things from a range of zero to 20 years. None had diabetes themselves, but, but many of them had family members who did. Um, this is a picture of our team. And as uh, Steve described, the population in American Samoa, they were representative of, of, our, of that population. Um, now, the, the flip charts. Uh, 
Rochelle described some of the features of these. And, and I should mention, as we mapped our qualitative data and um, the pre-seed, proceed model, um, I'm just giving you a couple of examples of these. We, um, we had essentially eight, sec eight chapters, um, sort of what is diabetes and then the seven uh, behaviors that I mentioned earlier. And then within each of those, there were three sections to correspond to the precede, uh, proceed model. So there was sort of a motivational section on, on predisposing factors, a, a skill building session for the enabling factors, and then a, the third section was on um, reinforcing factors. That was, so that was about engaging family and community support and, and medical staff support um, within the session. So in this case, as Rochelle mentioned, um, we, we have both languages. And that was also important to our staff. I mean, people um, speak more than one language. They often go back and forth between languages. They're, they're, and some were more comfortable in some context with Samoan or, or, or with English. Um, so we had sections, you know, talking points. We had a background for the staff. And then this piece, this was a, a CHW page. Um, this provided a picture of what the patients would see. So the patients' pages had less text for lower health literacy, um, had more pictures. Um, and so this gives a glimpse of that. And I'll show you both. This is one on the diet. So a background, um, this concept, which is not new to us, was used in, in, um, by the CDC and other interventions on teaching about changing diet, red light, yellow light, um, uh, green light sections. This is a picture of the patient page. Now let me show you the patient page. Um, so, and we give examples of the, the types of foods that would be green light foods versus uh, yellow and red light foods. Um, and, and as Rochelle mentioned, the uh, quotes were um, in many of the pages. So this is a quote from the, the focus groups that illustrates how people themselves were dealing with um, making better choices. So in our um, the study enrollment, um, we, uh, we used um, very uh, generous, uh, broad criteria for enrollment because this was a translation trial. We wanted it to be representative of the, the sample. Um, however, we did exclude people if they had a um, they didn't have type two diabetes, obviously. If they they had to, uh, if they if they were um, having a, a chronic condition that might lead to death, like cancer, kidney disease, or they became pregnant, um, those were primarily the the types of um, exclusion criteria. We randomized 268 people by village um, into the community health worker and the control group. Um, uh, Shira talk about church attendance. That's kind of an interesting one, but she'll speak to that. As um, HbA1c, the goal for American Diabetes Association is to be around seven, so this is pretty high um, to start with, almost 10. And, and the risk levels that we broke out, so uh, most of them, almost half of them were in the high risk level to begin with. Um, body mass index, as Steve mentioned, um, was certainly high, on average 36. Um, and blood pressure was not so high um, to begin with, um, so that wasn't an area that uh, we saw change in. Dose, um, let me speak about that while Shira talks more about our outcomes. Um, the We were very pleased with, with our delivery through our team. We defined um, fidelity in this, in translation research, in this case through the algorithm and wheth whether the dose was delivered. And, and this is a whole other topic we could talk at some length of, and we have at NIH at one of the dissemination conferences about how you define translation, how do you define de fidelity when you're doing translation research. Um, but we defined it through delivery of the, um, of the algorithm. So our staff delivered um, a total 1,728 visits over the course of a year. 
Um, the average length, about 33%. Most of those were with patient alone, about 25% with other family members. The, while we asked people in high risk to attend groups as a bit more efficient way to deliver weekly care, only about 50% attended at least one group. Um, but our staff chased them down and met with them one-on-one -on -one if they couldn't come to group, and that allowed us, that flexibility allowed us to reach a 74% average of expected visits. So, so we feel pretty good about that. Um, but even with that, even with the weekly attendance um, that it was expected of higher risk people, they still attended about twice a month um, with that. So, um, so the main findings, um, before I turn it, I th is this one is yours? I think this was my summary and then it's yours. Right, um, that, that the nurse, our team, our CHW team can deliver at a fairly high rate of fidelity. Um, the de they handle the decision rules pretty well, although simpler decision rules probably would be even better, um, but that, served to that proved to be a good model. 91% um, uh, retention rate. The cost was pretty modest, um, 656, uh, dollars per participant in during the year. Now this was not designed to be a, a cost effectiveness um, study. Um, so this was just looking at cost of delivery and I can go into that in more detail if people are interested in how we how we covered it. I, there is another slide here, but I'd rather I'd rather in the interest of time move on and we can come back to that if people want to know more about it. So Kira. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the primary outcome um, as well as some of the secondary analyses we've done. Um, for someone like me, this data is, this is the good stuff. Um, and I'm a bit of a numbers nerd, as some people here know, so I do get excited about this. But, you know, the data here is longitudinal. We have um, repeated measures per participant, say, on the primary outcome, which was HbA1c. But adding to the complexity is the study design. As um, was mentioned previously, um, participants were randomized by village, which adds a level of complexity to the analysis that we had to take into account. So sort of what you're going to see in a common theme of how we analyze the data was handling some of these issues. So not only do we have clustering sort of by village, but we also have it by household within village. So there's sort of these two levels of nesting um, that we had to deal with, um, which I get excited about and other people sometimes make a face, but that's okay. Mm -hmm. um, and as Judy mentioned, we had this issue of um, church contamination. So this was sort of a struggle we really, we really faced. Um, the issue was, and my colleagues are probably a little better to, at describing this than me, but within a village there were churches, and this community, went, um, the participants went to church, but not necessarily within their own village. So they were randomized by village, and let's say, for example, somebody in, in one of the villages goes to a church that's in another village, but that village was randomized to the other condition. Now you have the risk of contamination. So we really had to take that into account, and we were trying to come up with sort of a creative solution to do that, and, um, well, we thought we were pretty clever, and we created sort of this variable which, which actually um, told us whether or not the each participant was at risk for contamination because in the data we knew what church they went to, we knew where that church was in terms of a village, and we knew whether that village was in the CHW arm or the control arm. So it's sort of a complexity we had to deal with. Um, so I'm just going to highlight some of the analyses we've run so far. It's an ongoing process. Um, keep in mind that all of these analyses were run on the intent to treat samples, so all participants randomized were included in the analysis. So. Right, that's so fast. Um, so for a moment here, we're going to talk about sort of the main study outcome. So the main outcome here was HbA1c. And the question was whether or not there was intervention effects in changes in HbA1c. So what we did was we fit um, a longitudinal mixed effects model. We adjusted for this the two levels of clustering. We, we adjusted for this issue of church contamination as well as um, a number of other confounders, um, which are outlined up here. <coughs> Pardon me. And what we found was that there was a significant effect of the intervention. 
those randomized to the CHW arm show greater reductions in HbA1c from time one to time two, even when you account for things like um, comorbidities, <coughs> beliefs about diabetes, age, gender, and risk level. So that was our primary aim. Um, a subsequent aim that was of interest was not just how much they changed, but whether it was a clinically significant change. And so we define that as whether or not participants um, decreased their HbA1c by at least 5%. And so what we found, these are the unadjusted numbers right here. So amongst the intervention or the CHW arm, we found that 42.1% made the clinically significant change in HbA1c versus 32% in usual care. When we adjusted for these confounders and this clustering, uh, what we found is that this was a significant difference. And so, in other words, the odds of making a clinically significant change in HbA1c was higher among CHWs than controls. Interestingly enough, there was also a moderator involved, and that was risk level. So those who were at high risk, um, for those at high risk, the CHWs had an even greater odds of making a clinically significant change in HbA1c versus um, usual care, and this effect didn't exist among the low and moderate um, risk level. So we examined moderators ranging from risk to age to gender, sort of um, all the, the chosen um, demographics and things like that that were chosen a priori. So um, we also looked at whether there was a change in sort of these secondary outcomes, blood pressure, weight, waist circumference, and did not find any significant differences between intervention and control. So as a secondary um, analysis of interest was looking at um, the utilization of primary care visits and ER visits. And what we found here was that there was an increase in the primary care visits over the course of the intervention um, between um, CHWs and controls. So, um, so what you can see is the blue line here is this was in the year preceding the intervention. That's the number of primary care visits versus um, during the actual intervention phase. So you saw an increase in primary care visits among CHWs, and you didn't see this among controls. So we, we kind of moved on from there to look at mediation and sort of asked the question is, why did the intervention work? So what was it that sort of was driving that? And we looked at um, various um, mediators, including healthy eating, medication adherence, physical activity behavior, and this um, PCP visits that we just talked about. Now, this was challenging in that not only do we have this clustering and this um, sort of risk of contamination, we also have binary mediators and a continuous outcome. So it just gets basically more fun by the second. So what we did is looked at a multiple mediation model. So the question was how do all these things sort of work together to influence how the intervention impacts HbA1c? And we used bootstrap standard errors, and um, the interest was really in estimating the total effect of the intervention, as well as the direct and indirect effect. And what we have is, um, what we found was that the reductions in HbA1c in the CHWs versus the controls from time one to time two was really a result, we think, of increasing healthy eating and medication adherence, um, and to some degree, um, increasing your physical activity and PCP visits. Now, we recognize that the challenge with this particular data was that we only measure things at two time points. So we know they're healthy eating at baseline. We know they're healthy eating at end of treatment. We don't have it sometime in between. So we recognize it's a limitation of the work, but we're going to assume that these um, factors changed before HbA1c changed. So I'm going to actually, that was quick, but I'm going to pass this back to Steve to wrap up the show. Yeah, I, I think that we want to uh, turn to questions and answers. We all agree that's always way more fun. Uh, and so we'll, uh, I'll go through this relatively promptly. <coughs> but um, clearly, we feel this was successful. The primary outcomes are uh, just uh, showed up online in, in the journal Diabetes Care. Um, we're hoping for several more uh, high impact journals for the utilization measures and the mediation analyses. Um, we were able to show these important uh, changes, not just statistical, but uh, clinical important, while recognizing that even at the end, the HbA1c levels were uncomfortably high by any clinical standard, uh, even with the reductions. 
Um, and we don't want to just say, well, that's Samoa, because in my experience, that's what people were doing for the 20 years before we did this. Oh, well, we're Samoans, we're naturally big. We're not, you know, no. But so that's, we have work to do on that. <coughs> we, wonderful data collection led us to be able to do the mediation analyses that <coughs> Shira just mentioned. Uh, and we want to uh, pick these apart even more. And, and Judy and her uh, clinical psychology intern is, are helping do that a little bit more. And we're working on that. Um, and we want to be able to, uh, to write this up relatively promptly. Clearly, um, this is really what Shira is beginning to get at. And we'll, we'll finalize those analyses in the manuscript form, we, we hope. Um, because we, the CHW intervention was given to the weightless control group, we, uh, one of the medical students came in who we're hoping gets money to go there this summer to look at that. We'll be able to understand about HbA1c changes in both trial arms over a one to three year period after the end uh, of the last CHW visit. Um, we really want to understand this. That's been done. Uh, we want to look at this. There's another current MPH student who we hope will get funding to go to America so this summer and with Omar Galarraga's help collect detailed data on costs to the healthcare system uh, so that we can really do uh, retrospectively and unplanned from the beginning point of view, a cost effectiveness uh, analysis, including a slightly different way of estimating the cost of us actually doing the intervention. Um, we want to do that. And I think this is the most challenging. Uh, I began to talk with them about this last June. And when I go again this April, we'll talk about this. So we have to identify funds because I think they're convinced they would like this. If they do roll out, if they take this intervention and move it to the other community health centers, uh, even the hospital we read in the, the newspaper is beginning to do something like this, but not exactly. Uh, we'd like to make it a research proposition uh, to do the scale out, scale up and rolling out. And um, you know that's going to be difficult, but we're hoping to do that. Uh, excuse me. Thank you very much, Dr. Lava. Um, and this really couldn't have been done without all these folks. Um, Ophir and Osalia and John Tuitele, who the clinical executive director and clinical director. There are other scientists involved. Uh, Andrew, who's here, uh, a bachelor's graduate at Brown. Jeffrey Bloom, who was a biostatistician who worked with Judy and me and Rochelle at the beginning. Uh, Mike Goldstein, who's very familiar to many of you. Our field directors, many of them. Uh, products of Brown, either the bachelor's or, or MPH, Kelly Smith, who happens to be here in the audience today, uh, and several Brown University students who assisted in, um, as I tell my students, the scut work, although I think I use another word, um, <laughs> uh, and, and some bachelor's theses. And we are delighted to take questions uh, that you may have, and please feel free to ask them of us. Uh, Akil, did you want to do something right now or just continue? Great. Yes, please. Thank you. An amazing um, body of work that I've been sort of following from a distance, and it's just it's wonderful to hear the outcome. I have a question about whether the, there was any follow up to what the experience was of being a participant in the research and having someone visiting you with you know, monthly or tracking you down at the workplace or whatever? We, we did that in two ways. This is going to be interesting. Um, <laughs> I'll be your yeah, carrier. Uh, um, all things go back to Steve um, on this project. Um, Damn straight. Right. Um, we did that in two ways. So we did focus groups with we did three focus groups with a total of 12. We had recruitment or perhaps at that point retention issues. We had lots of people expected and not a lot of people came. So we have three focus groups with 12 participants who uh, we asked what their experience was in the study. And by and large, they said, it was terrific. Why did you end? Um, it's not my richest data, qualitatively, honestly. Um, the focus groups were conducted in Samoan by uh, a woman who um, didn't dig um, and maybe didn't have 
didn't allow them the permission to say things negative as much as I like to think I would have myself. But um, learning Samoans on my to-do list, but it hadn't happened in that time. Um, we also asked about the experience of delivering this intervention with our staff. And they told us a lot about what participants asked of them. And we also saw over the course of the, um, the years that this was um, in the field, and, and Kelly can talk about being the field director and, and see living this, people would come into our clinic room quite often and seek out the community health workers in an unscheduled time or an unscheduled manner. So the community health workers clearly became a resource to participants in the study, even beyond the algorithms that, you know, um, shaped when people had um, scheduled contact. Um, and I think that that comes from a lot of, uh, a lot of things. There's a long tradition of um, visiting village nurses that we um, sort of were in the footsteps of. Um, and um, it's a resource poor environment. And suddenly these people had a resource who, uh, resources that cared about them and um, they turned to them quite often. I think, Rochelle, you and I both feel that the, the post-intervention focus groups <coughs> were difficult to do also because there's a strong cultural structure, if you will, of gratitude and not saying bad things. And I think, humbly speaking, we did a really good job offering this service to our, the participants and they were very grateful. Mm -hmm. So they just weren't, they didn't want to talk any bad stuff. Uh, to us, and then the structural issue was the Samoan woman who did the facilitation of those focus groups was an older, reasonably high status woman, and I think um, they just weren't going to they weren't going to get down with her. <laughs> wasn't going to happen. Do you think that's a fair yeah, statement? I think that is yeah. Fair. More questions, please. Mm -hmm. Chris, um, just I was curious. One of the things that you had on there was was classifying the risk groups as alcohol use and, and tobacco use, and just curious about how much that came up in conversations and what your thoughts are about those health behaviors. Mm -hmm. yeah. with those they were actually fairly low in this population, um, so they didn't become a big driver of the, the algorithms, um, partly because this is an older population, a very religious population, lots of Seventh-day Adventists and Mormons and such, and um, so, they, so there were really a very small, less than 10 percent, in both smoking and, and uh, alcohol use. Um, but we wondered whether, in fact, there were some cases where we, when we went back to do the follow-up interview where we found that the person had been smoking at baseline <laughs> and <laughs> didn't. So there is a, perhaps a bit of um, social desirability in that. We have another, another study that Rochelle and Steve was involved with, with, with um, Bob Swift, where th that you probably have heard about. So we'll get to compare some of our data with that um, in terms of um, just to check our rates and see how typical they are. Yeah. Would you add anything? No, no. And similarly with depression, I, uh, um, the diabetes literature has pretty high rates of depression among people for di with diabetes. And we found fairly low rates. We really didn't find anybody at sort of clinical depression levels, some stress, and in retrospect, we probably should have uh, measured more for diabetes distress rather than depression, but, but that's kind of what the literature was doing. Um, but there, too, because of the other study, we have um, another sample we can compare that with and as we kind of look we have at. The Brown undergraduate yeah. currently exploring the depression uh, data from the SADA, which is a structured interview about alcohol and drug ab uh, and, and abuse. And they used a skid as a depression inventory. We used a PHQ-9. So she's exploring a little deeper at the item level, cross uh, classifications mm -hmm. among the items using the two studies. We have some reliability, uh, small scale, small sma sample size. We'll begin to get at that a little bit. But and you can um, compare with SADA. The too, ethnographic so we literature have is full of the uh, fact that Samoans are raised to not speak openly about negative emotions. You know, we don't want to exotify Samoans. Many of us come from families and cultures where this is quite similar. This is not that surprising. It's just real recent and it's right here in front of us. So if we want to measure mental health, emotional expression, we're, we're going to have to uh, dig a little deeper and go a little bit further. 
I've done some of that in some earlier work, but uh, anyway, in order of some hands I saw Beth, I think, and was there. And Kate Please, and Beth. Akilah, did we, did we get yours? <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. Right. Bingo. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that is a big that is a, a big concern because, um, you know, it, and there's been a lot of ethnographic literature on that. But um, for example, when we were there doing our preliminary meetings, um, I was told by somebody from the American Diabetes Association's voluntary group there, um, a, a, a person who had diabetes, that I would be an embarrassment to the family because I was so thin. So, so yes, there is this expectation, and, and there is pride in being big, and um, in, in especially among older people. So yes, there there is that. Although we there we do have evidence that that's changing, and some um, newer research that's being done by by people that um, we know uh, um, are is looking at some of the changes in, in that because of media. Yes, I mean I think level of the qu this question asked you essentially yes. I, mean, we, I published something a few years ago about <coughs> body image and its response, that body image and the difference between self-report of where I am and where I would like to be. That divergence is greater among, no surprise, young Noel is greater young women. That's right, so we're yeah. beginning to see some changes. And I think many people recognize that the levels of obesity that are in, you know, the sort of BMI's over 40. No one nowadays really considers that a mark of prestige or honor or something to be emulated. What we, I think it's fair to say, both in Samoa and American Samoa, people now, they see the risks of that. They also see some of the physical, literally the physical disability of people can't move around, they need a lot of help getting from place to place, and um, I think that's seen as a negative. But uh, we don't have a lot of systematic data on this. That said, it's interesting though that while there is this sort of media I image that's that's be growing there, at the same time we found that younger population was heavier. Um, well, so in our sample. In our sample. Yeah. I mean, partly that's because um, you know we older people may be a bit more traditional. Um, that I think the fast food movement um, that's that's become come there and life stress and juggling family and jobs and everything else is is higher among younger people so it does there seems to be more challenges in terms of uh, and more conflict around weight yeah So basically, the, um, we uh, scientists now know in New Zealand, which has a large Pacific Islander population, both the indigenous Maori mm -hmm. as well as large numbers of uh, Samoans and Tongans and Cook Islanders, have done uh, fairly extensive uh, underwater weighing and DEXA, uh, which are gold standards for under for uh, body composition, and they showed that at the same levels of uh, body fat that the WHO standards for 25 and 30 respectively, we need, they suggested that the levels of body fat conducive to that are down to 26 BMI and 32 BMI for obesity. So it's a pretty much straight comparison, somewhat like people are doing for East, a East and South and East Asians, where they, their criteria for both 25 and 30 have been dropped down to 23 and Those methods suggest it's reinforcement. So much so that we've measured uh, skeletal dimensions and muscular dimensions following my typical biological anthropology training, measuring everything you can on everybody. And um, we can.
talking about underexploited data. If anybody has interest in this stuff, <laughs> I have data going back to the 70s, including the work we did in that big genetic study that Dr. Hall is doing um, recently in, in Samoa, where, where we can exploit that. And we have bioelectrical impedance data uh, from the most recent two cohorts in early 2000 and 2010 uh, that we could use as well. So, is that responsive? Well, I was pleased to see that on the one hand that um, going to family homes, um, particularly for like Sunday dinners and such, families were beginning to have other choices there. So the typical foods would be there, but they would also bring in salads and water instead of just soda. So there were changes like that happening. Um, but at the same time, we, with our staff, I mean, one of the issues when you're working particularly with lay people in, is uh, recognizing uh, kind of w how you can be a good role model and how do you deal with that sensitively, and that, that was a challenge. Um, the, there was food always in our office. I mean, people were eating constantly, and it was mostly snack foods and such that were not part of the traditional diet. So the traditional diet would have been sort of a big – Light breakfast, a big meal in the middle of the day, and a light, lighter meals later. Oh, Kelly, Kelly was a field 